and for bringing us to this space and time in this day. I pray, Father, that you will give us ears to hear, give us an understanding, Lord, as we are prepared, Father, to lead from every area. I thank you for what uh, you will put on the hearts of these candidates and for how you will give us, Father, uh, to hear, to receive together, that God, our communities and your people at large shall be blessed. We thank you. We give you all glory and honor now. Bless every leader who is here. Bless those who are virtually postured. We give you all the thanks, glory, honor, and praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for having us. Thank you for hosting this setting. Um, and let's begin by um, welcoming everyone to this to this space. Um, I am Bishop Daniel. I am the senior pastor of Greater Door Church, Rocky Mount, Bono Rapids, as well as president of the um, Eastern North Carolina Middle Steel Alliance. And so this is a continued conversation uh, that we have, have begun. Um, I want to share uh, while we're still moving in that the objectives of the Alliance are to serve as an advocate for religious community uh, for the Eastern North Carolina area, promote uh, uh, improvement of social, political, and educational conditions along with health for all of the citizens of Eastern North Carolina. And so when we come to moments such as this, we are here tonight to be informed and we are here to get distinctions on platforms from our two candidates. Um, I'm gonna begin with a few moments of statements or rules. Uh, Senator Fitch and Representative Smith, thank you guys for coming to share with the area, Wilson District area uh, tonight. And it is our belief that informed voters will yield the best persons in this uh, hinky political environment. So, candidates, I know that this is not your first uh, rodeo with conversation and forums, but um, after 30 years of pastoring, I know that we need, two, 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 two groups of people need instruction when you give them a microphone. One of them is the preacher, and the other one is the politician. And so we want to set some ground rules for the night. So let's take a few minutes to go through instruction. Each candidate will be given three minutes to introduce themselves and give us a little information about your platform. And then we will go through a series of questions that have been sent in from this area, uh, questions that have been provided for from um, folks that have uh, some inquisitive uh, thoughts about the two of you and what will happen uh, in the event of who gets elected. And so we'll give you, we'll give you, um, each of you, we're going to give you two minutes to answer the question and then if there's need for rebuttal, uh, we'll do so. When you, when you see this sign right here, this means you got 60 seconds. And when you see this sign right here, it means you got 30 seconds. And when you see this sign right here, you, your time already up. So we ask that you would limit your time to that. And if if you don't if you don't stop at that time, then you'll hear this sound, and we'll be ringing it loud enough. And uh, I think we got some sound folks back right there. If they don't stop in, then y'all shut their mics off. All right. So we, we're, we're grateful. Thank you guys for being here. Let's open. Let's open with um, opening statements from both of you and. Whichever one of you want to begin can do so. Uh, three minutes, I'll be running the time clock here, but three minutes um, of introduction and a little bit about your platform, if you will. Well, Bishop Daniel, um, pastors, congregation, people in the audience, thank you for allowing us to be here. And I'll go first, because Toby always wants me to go first, so I'm going to take the liberty of going first today. Um, I am Raymond E. Smith, Jr. I'm currently 
the representative, um, House District 21, which encompasses Wayne County and Sampson County. Uh, those of us in the House serve districts of approximately 83 to 85,000 people, and so I have a large area to cover. The district that I represent is not an easy district. It is a primarily Republican district. So the fact that I even exist in and of itself is, is, is somewhat of a tale. I am the son of Raymond and Thelma Smith Sr. My, my, both of my parents are deceased. My father was a United States Marine. My mother was a lifelong educator. Uh, my mother was um, also a politician, if you will. She served on the Board of Education for 18 years until her passing. Both of my parents being community servants led, laid that in my spirit. I actually don't know any better than to be a public servant. That's who I am, that's what I am, that's what I was raised to be. I'm one of the leaders in the General Assembly. There's three forms of affirmation, I believe. One, when the public or the citizens in your community elect you to lead. That's the first form of affirmation. The second form of affirmation is when your peers, the people that you serve with, the other elected leaders, assert they elect you to lead them. So I'm one of the minority whips in the House Caucus, which means I'm one of the Democratic leaders. And lastly, also I'm a member of the North Carolina Leg Black Legislative Black Caucus, and I'm in a leadership role there as well. Um, that is, I was voted into that leadership role by both the Senate and House members. But the last form of affirmation is when you receive those first two affirmations, then you get into office and you actually get something done. And I'm very proud of the things that I've been able to accomplish in my short time in the General Assembly. Most recently in this budget, two of the bills that I, that I offered are incorporated in this year's budget. budget. House Bill 921, which is the Tier 1 Community Reinvestment Bill, and House Bill 946, which is a sound basic education. Those two bills are so critical when you talk about what is happening in our community today. And further, and later on in our conversation, I'll get into more detail about why those bills are critical. But my platform will always begin with education. Education, education, education. Education, in my humble opinion, is the foundation of everything that we do and everything that we are. We talk about crime, we talk about poverty, we talk about all these things, but education is the foundation to address each and every one of them. And as I said earlier, We'll get more into detail about that as we go further. Thank you. My name is my name is Milton F. Fitch Jr. I'm a lifelong resident of Wilson, North Carolina, and Eastern North Carolina. I graduated from the schools here, public schools in Wilson. My mother and father uh, were very active in this community. My mother served as a county commissioner. My father uh, as a public agitator trying to make sure that the city of Wilson did those things that would benefit all. I went to law school, finished law school, came back to Wilson to practice law. I practiced law with G.K. Butterfield and Quentin Sumner under the law firm of Fitch Butterfield and Sumner. I was elected to the General Assembly in 1984, representing Wilson, Nash, and Edgecombe counties. I served in the House for approximately 20 years. I left the House and I went to a stint on the bench for 18 years on the Superior Court. I retired from the Superior Court and I was appointed by the governor to fill an unexpired term of one Angela Bryant from Rocky Mount who went on to serve in the Paroles Commission. I've been elected twice to the Senate. I've held leadership positions in the House. There are not a lot of positions in the Senate. You basically have the President Pro Temper, pro temper the uh, leader of the different parties. I've done pretty much every piece of legislation and led throughout my career in public service and more particularly in the North Carolina House. 
My life has been full of serving people. I will always serve people. And really when you look at it, you look at the credentials between uh, my friend and my colleague uh, as to platforms is not much different. Education starts with me. I understand that education is the engine that drives everything that we do, just as he does. And alongside that is economic development. I'm ready to stand any questions that you may have. So, gentlemen, there are, we want to deal with a cadre of questions, about 10 questions, and we'll begin in the area of voting rights and democracy. A question was sent in, and this is, this is what was said, first of all, democracy, democracy depends on the idea of one person having one vote. 20 states implemented ADR. Those that may not know what that is, that is automatic voter registration. What are your thoughts on automatic voter registration and voter ID and any other thoughts on how the ballot box can best be protected in North Carolina? Well, I think that the ballot box has been protected already. Uh, I've served in the legislature when uh, we did a lot of innovative things such as early voting. Early voting still stands today. Uh, the the main, main thing is equal access to the ballot. It should be all. I think this country and its founding says give me your tide, your pool, your other, other masses are yearning to be free and it still is that way today. We live in a time today when people want to restrict and cut off any access to anything that is in leadership if it involves people of color. I'm opposed to voter ID in the present fashion that it is because it does not give you an inclusive situation which should. I always have thought that there were more than one way to, to register people to vote. You have people who pay taxes, you have people who have licenses, you have people who have tags on their cars. You have the welfare rolls. I don't understand why a country such as America, a state such as North Carolina, could not utilize all of those if you were true about what you mean to say that you are true about, and that is that everybody has the opportunity. It is time for everybody to realize that the story that has been told by those who were in previous administrations it's just that, a story and a fairy tale. There was not, nor has there ever been, all of this fraud that they are talking about. Someone who loses can always cry foul and say it was rigged, it was taken away. I don't think it happened in the last election and I don't think it's happening now. Thank you. AVR, automatic voter registration, is absolutely essential. There's, apps, there's so many different things that, uh, as was said earlier, that we can use to make sure individuals are rich to the vote. There's, uh, I mean, when we talk about selective service, I'm a, com I'm a military veteran. I was required, I was required when I turned a certain age to register for selective service. And there was nothing else that was going to happen until I did register for selective service. So when we, when we talk about the ability to do something, that's one thing. The other thing is the will. The current leaders that we have in our General Assembly, the people who are currently in the um, majority in our General Assembly, General Assembly, want nothing more than to suppress our ability to vote. Also, they want to suppress health care. They want to suppress immigration. They want to suppress everything that is beneficial to those of us who are most in need. Voter ID, the last bill that I saw, was absolutely atrocious. And the reason why is because it's not all inclusive. There's not a provision for every type of ID that there is. So we've been voting all these years without a voter ID. And the process has proven not to have the fraud that others claim that it does have. So you can manufacture a problem 
You know, this is this voter ID thing is really a uh, a solution in search of a problem. The problem doesn't exist. So as we look forward, as we cast our votes, we need to make sure we fully understand exactly what is being done here. What is the real purpose? What's behind all of this? What's behind it is to suppress your vote to make sure that your voice is not heard. There's an old saying, if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. And I want to make sure that we have someone representing this community at the table at all times. So you both spoke around um, public education being the platform. And so it's been nearly 30 years since the uh, Leandro case was filed. And um, it was all about children receiving a sound, uh, equitable, basic education. And so today, North Carolina is still not adequately funding its um, public education. And as a result, the academics and emotional needs of our children are being met. What are your thoughts? And we'll begin with you, um, Senator Fitch, around funding the Leandro Bill and, and what are your most important policies around improving uh, public education? Well, the most important uh, solution to that particular problem is to fund it as the courts have said it do. Uh, presently, what we have is a failure of even the court to enforce its own order. Uh, we now are dealing with Leandro, but let's go back and let's talk the history part of it. We can go back to Terry Sanford being the governor when he decreed that every child in the echoing the Constitution should have a quality and equal education. What he attempted to do at that time was to enact a tax on food. And the tax on food was to bring you financially to a place that the system would be able to sustain itself. Then we had children who were classified as Willie M. And they didn't do what they were supposed to do by Willie M. And then it became Thomas S. And that actually is the Leandro situation. Everybody knows, in my opinion, that education is not funded to the level that it should be. The largest communities who have the ability to put an extra tax on will every day of the week steal teachers and everything else because they have the funds for it. first to put into the system, two to give people the needs that they need, the supplies, etc. And we just don't want to spend that money. I may be a little different from Raymond, but I lay the I lay the blame on folks like us not understanding the system and old white males who don't think that anybody else should have a seat at the table. And so until we, as a race of people, exercise our right to vote in huge numbers, this thing will continue to be in the same fashion that it is. If you stay home and you don't vote, it's going to happen to us. We have to change the complexity and the relationship between Democrats and Republicans in the North Carolina House the North Carolina Senate, totally across the board. This is something that is near and dear to my heart. I was a former educator. I taught in K-12. I taught middle school. And as I told you before, I'm also a combat veteran. I don't know which one was tougher, <laughs> middle school or, or the battlefield. But I can tell you that the Leandro case is a prime example. It reminds me of uh, Brown versus Board. It took so much. It took way too much time for Brown versus Board to come to fruition, and it's taken way too much time for Leandro to come to fruition as well. The last two bienniums I have authored. I'm a primary sponsor on a bill for ensuring a sound basic education, as it says in our constitution. In this budget, in this budget, the judge who 
ordered the General Assembly to, to, to fund $1.7 billion in this year's budget to fund Leandro, cited the bill that I wrote, House Bill 946. Me and three other members of the House authored that bill, and it was incorporated in this year's budget. And the, the judge who came about said that that's the term, those were the terms that we needed to use. Now, the full funding of Leandro is in the billions of dollars. There's a, there's a report called West Ed. In the West Ed report, it outlines in detail, in great detail, how that money is to be spent on teacher training, administrator training, student services, all the various things that are outlined in that bill. Those are the parts that we know we are going to have to continue to fight for. So as was said, that bill came about and is wound up in the budget due to working with the other side. The, uh, otherwise, it wouldn't have been in that budget. We had to make a compromise, and that compromise resulted in that not fully funded yet. However, that it was funded, and that's why I did vote for the budget, because it's going to help children in the state of North Carolina. One of the er other areas of concern is around our um, increasing opiate epidemic. So the question is, how and on addressing the overdose and epidemic that is currently ongoing and rising. There's an op epidemic before the legislature declared that it was an epidemic. When we were walking down the street as human beings living in this country, it was against the law to sell the opiates and to not have treatment and all of these things. It never got to be an epidemic until folks who don't look like you and I started overusing Recreational, I guess, is what you would call it. They had prescriptions. They had prescriptions given to them by physicians, and they were able to, to get it. It then became a problem. It's been a problem ever since the Italians or whoever it was in the, in the Costa Nostra and the cartel started pushing this stuff in the streets to control, and that's what it's all about. It is a control situation. I never will forget the first time I watched the movie, The Godfather. There's a line in there that says, when Don Corleone says, we don't need to mess with this stuff, and somebody says, oh, all we'll do is just sell it up there and holler. So it was always intended to be for us, because it is a way to control generations yet to come, and it's the closest thing to the Willie Lynch theory that I've ever seen in my life, except this is in pill form or in needle form when it's not that way otherwise. I think that we ought to make laws, we ought to have rehabilitation and treatment, and we ought to stick to it because we know what the problem is and we just ought to address it. If we can send people to the moon and bring them back, we ought to be able to solve that problem. It's amazing that they call the opioid epidemic an epidemic because when crack was prevalent in our communities, it was criminalized. You were a criminal because you were on drugs. You were treated as though you were absolutely nothing. But because the opioid ep ep so-called epidemic has uh, attacked other communities that don't look like us, then now we're talking about treatment and and, and forgiveness and uh, working with individuals to get them off of drugs. Well, I think that we have to address that disparity first, okay? We have to address that first. Let's not sugarcoat it. We are treated differently for the same thing. Secondly, yes, treatment is definitely warranted. It's not a, it's not a crime to be sick. Individuals who are hooked on drugs are sick. They're not criminals. They may commit criminal acts in order to feed that monster, if you will, 
but they're not criminals by nature. They are doing that so that they can feed that need. So as we talk about this thing called the opioid epidemic, we've got to talk about Medicaid expansion in the same conversation. You can't talk about one without the other. You have people who need medicine. We have people who need medical attention. We have people who are sick. But yet and still, we have fighting every day in Raleigh to make sure that we are keeping Medicaid expansion on the table. Why, is it been, why has it not been passed? We as an electorate hasn't, haven't done our due diligence. We've got to vote people in who will fight for Medicaid expansion so that everybody can go see the doctor. Everybody can go get treatment when they need treatment. That's what this is really about. It's not about who you like and who you don't like. It's about who's going to fight for you. So everywhere we go, we see hiring signs. We see help wanted. But still, all of the businesses are struggling, <clears throat> suffering from lack of employees, and they are not able to meet the customer demand. So the question is, what are your thoughts on how we improve and increase the workforce, particularly in our rural eastern North Carolina areas? Start, start treating the worker as though they're human beings. You know, we say that we can't find people to work. I don't believe that. I think we can find people to work, but nobody is going back to work for the peanuts that they want to pay as a minimum wage. It's not going to happen. I recall before the pandemic, going to Western Sizzler and buying a steak for the baked potato and some mushroom that cost me $10. I then decided, and I think these numbers are somewhere right, I then decided that I was going to carry my daughter out and feed her to the same state that I had. The same state in the pandemic cost me $53. Now, if I'm working for this restaurant and I'm receiving the food in, I know how much it costs because I get the invoice. I know how much you're selling it for because I'm ringing up the cash register. And I know how much you're paying me so I know how much profit you're making. And you think I'm gonna keep right on making that money for you? And my family is starving. We need to move further than a minimum wage and start talking about a living wage. Now, the legislative process is not a fast process. So I have advocated in the past that we ought to have a minimum wage of at least $15 an hour. Now in that short time that I've had that type of feeling, you can't make it off of $15 an hour. So if that's all that we are willing to do, it's not going to work, it is not indexed to the, the, the way the monies are spent, and if you're not going to give a person a piece of the pie, when they think they have you over the barrel, that's exactly where they will have you, over the barrel. Yes, I've authored bills in each session fighting for a $15 an hour minimum wage. We were able to get some of that done for some of the state employees but that's just getting started. We've got a long way to go with this. And yes, $15 an hour is still not gonna cut it. With inflation being what it is, I put $100 in my gas tank to get here today, and $15 an hour, that'll, that'll, eat, that up in a, that'll eat that up in a snap. So there's no way that $15 an hour is it. The answer has got to be comprehensive. What we're talking about when we talk about workforce, we're talking about not only the jobs themselves, but developing and training people to take these jobs. There are jobs out there, but we've got to go get retrained if we need to get retrained. 
We can't risk where we are. We can't just say, um, you know, I, I, I've, I've done this and so I'm going to find the job in this. We've got to be willing to diversify ourselves. Also, there's a plethora of funding in this year's budget. Some of it is through the Department of Commerce. Some of it is through grants. I wrote a bill, House Bill 921, which was also incorporated in the grant. That's the Tier 1 Community Investment Bill. In that bill, I called for $100 million to go to Tier 1 counties like Wilson, like Wayne, and like Green, so that these counties can, can take the, the grants and loans that you can get from this bill through the Golden Leaf Foundation, and you can do workforce preparedness training. You can do uh, community-based grants. If you have a 501c3, you can tap into this money. It's available. And through the Department of Commerce, they're looking for opportunities in rural communities. Same thing with the Department of Environmental Quality. I know Wilson is no different than Wayne and Green. You have infrastructure needs here. Water, sewer, things that are preventing the community from growing. All of that is incorporated, but what we have to do is make sure that we have someone out there who is telling us where all of this stuff is. And I can tell you where it is. I sent out a monthly newsletter to my constituents, and I keep them informed constantly about what's going on and what's available. But we have to have these conversations early and often. But rural economic development is something that we have to make an intentional effort to make sure that we are doing. So since we're around that area of the workforce, next question is actually similar, but around housing. And the question or the statement was that the workforce and low income housing inventory is near depleted. And so what steps can be taken to increase the supply of not only affordable, but safe uh, housing in Eastern North Carolina? You hit it right on the head. It used to be affordable, but an affordable house that, uh, let's call it a shotgun house, uh, that is not safe, is not worth staying in, so it may not be affordable in the long run. Those two things ought to go together. It ought to be affordable, it ought to be decent, and it ought to be safe. I'm not one that talks about I did this yesterday and I did this today, but I, I want it to be known that all of us who have your heart and your interest at heart send out newsletters. When you look at the legislative process, no one person does a bill. The bill is made up of multiple people because you have to have at least 61 votes over on the House side and you must have at least 26 votes on the Senate side. There's a bill that was placed before that would require communities, cities, to relax and to change their zoning because one thing for sure, you don't make any more ground, you don't make any more earth. And if you have housing that can only go on an acre of land or a half acre of land, look how many people are going to be missing. There's also legislation called for tiny houses because everybody doesn't need a mansion to stay in. Some people can make it with, I guess what old folks would call efficiency units that would give you a place to stay, a place to cook, a place to use the facilities, and still have some recreational area. Those types of laws have to be put forth in these communities in order to allow individuals in this dwindling supply, because the supply is basically up. People tell me every day that I've been to the realtor and I can't get an apartment. Those same people a year and a half or two years ago would have told you I wouldn't stay in that apartment if they would have given it to me. Now there's no place else to go because the housing market it's very, very tight today. So it's very easy to open up with legislation that allows individuals to utilize the land in a fashion that is more equitable rather than trying to conserve it all uh, 
and some of that is being done both on the House side and on the Senate side. Affordable housing is a crisis, especially in our rural areas. I'm working with a gentleman in Lane County by the name of Thomas Rice right now. He's building tiny houses on an area called South Slope Street. And that is something that we made possible through legislation. And the senator is right. Legislation doesn't take one person. But when you are primary sponsor on a bill, that means it was partly your idea. Okay, ideas have to come from somewhere. And yes, you need to get support for those ideas, but you have to be vigilant and you have to be busy and you have to work to make sure that you're putting legislation out there. It's easy to attack something somebody else did, but at the end of the day, what did you do? Okay, so we've got to be, we've got to be responsible and responsive. So no, it's not just about putting out newsletters, but the newsletter that I put out, I can tell you, I get feedback all the time that it's helping a lot of people in my community find resources. And that, that's what this is all about. I'm your, I'm a constituent, I'm, I'm, your, I'm your constituent service person. I'm the person that connects you with resources. I'm the person that connects you with the Department of Health and Human Services if you need something. I'm the person that can get you to the governor's office. Okay, that's what I do. That's my job, is, to, is constituent services. So when it comes to affordable housing issues, there are CDBGs or Community Development Block Grant funds that go to every community. They are available through your municipality. In Wayne County, what we've done with our CDBG funds, we have done some renovations of houses. We have done, we have purchased some dilapidated housing, tore it down. We have, um, we have, we have really, if you've been downtown Goldsboro, if you haven't been to downtown Goldsboro, you need to go. It's beautiful. We're taking that money and we're taking full advantage of the opportunity to beautify our community. And all of that is a part of what we do as legislators. And I'm a, I have my hand in each and every one of those things in my community. So we have, we have touched on housing, workforce, public education, voting rights, which would probably bring us down to an argument around school chores. Since 2013, North Carolina has offered the opportunity scholastic program, initially designed for low-income families to opt out of their public school to attend a private or, or a religious school. And so funding for this program has increased to 15 million per year for the next 15 years and will continue to grow even if the money is not spent. Sometimes estimated projects cost three billion dollars. What are your thoughts on this program? Is it a good idea or is it not? Experience is a good teacher. Experience gives you the opportunity to look at it in a 360 degree fashion. <clears throat> I'll answer your question this way. We started, when I was in the legislature the first time, a program called Charter Schools. Charter schools were created not to supplant or to take the place of public schools. It was created as a test tube way to be able to innovatively put new ideas into the public school system. I stand here today to say that a charter school does not have the same regulations that public schools have. They don't have the same quality or quantity of teachers that public schools have. The class sizes are not the same, so when you started talking about that, you were talking about monies that are for the state to administer, they go to a charter school, and what ends up being kicked out of that charter school are folks who look like you and I, but the money doesn't come back. 
to the public school where that child has to be. The law has it mandatorily that you must, on the public school side, take every child you are able to cherry pick in the other schools. There has to be a way that if you're going to fund it in that particular fashion, you have to have a system that will follow the Constitution such that each child will have an opportunity to have a quality education. Well, Senator, no one Senator, before you start, so you, let me clarify your court, the, the answer. Is it a good idea or not? Is what your your question is a good idea? Yeah. I think your your question is not a good idea, and I gave the example by paralleling and giving the example of what charter schools have done to the public school system. Okay. School choice is a code word. Okay, it's a code word for let's resegregate schools. Because no one in this race knows better than I do about this whole thing called school choice. Prior to going to the General Assembly, I was the first African American ever elected countywide in Wayne County to serve on the Board of Education. There's only one countywide seat. And I beat a very wealthy Republican in doing so. What's significant about that? Well, it tipped the balance on the school board when that happened. And what we were able to do, we were able to get some really bad policies in the school system changed. The first one was the so-called open door policy. The open door policy was a policy that said, if you have space at this school and you're not satisfied with what's going on at this school, you can transfer your child to this other school. While, it's, while that sounds great, the problem with that is at the very bottom of that um, award letter letting you transfer your child, it said, however, you must provide your own transportation. Now, if your mother and father don't have reliable transportation, is that door open to you? Of course not. That door is not open to you. It's only open to those people who can access it. And it's the same thing with the charter schools. <coughs> Charter schools are, I wasn't around when that idea came up, but I would have told them it was not a great idea because it has resulted in resegregating our schools. Now, there have been some charter school successes, okay? Wilson Prep is one of those, okay? It's been a very successful school. Darrell Woodard and I go way back. Darrell's got his start in Wayne County. Me and Darrell have been, been friends for a lot of years. And he's doing great things over at Wilson Perfect. But at the end of the day, that's the exception to the rule. The vast majority of these charter schools are not producing what they should be. I was invited to speak, uh, how many of you heard of the Roland Martin Show? About four months ago, Roland had his staff call me and ask me to be on his show. And we were talking about these school vouchers and things of that nature. And I don't know who told Roland to call me, but the question, the first question he asked me, I told him that's the worst idea ever. And he said, well, well Representative Smith, why? And I told him, when you talk about parochial schools, they don't have the same standards that public schools. They don't have the same testing as public schools, okay? The teachers don't have to be certified. It burns me up to take state tax dollars and give it to private schools. I'll never support that. We have to improve our public schools. That's what we need to be focused on. We have got a plethora of money to do it. But the reason, part of the reason we don't have that money is because that state lottery that we were supposed, that education lottery, guess what happened to that money? It was supplanted. We were funding education at this level State lottery was supposed to bring it in and bring it up to this level, but what they did, they took the money out of education and put it elsewhere, and then now funding is not increased as they say they have. Thank you. 
So public safety is another area where a question was presented and says, violence is increasing not only here, but everywhere. It seems that incarcerating and policing our way out is not working. What, what are your thoughts on how we improve and re-image public safety? Well, it's, it's all of us working together. It starts at home. We as a race of people have had multiple institutions. We've had a home, we've had the church, and we've had our schools. All of them at this point in time have failed. And we're trying to fix it the old fashioned way and I'm not too sure if it's working. Respect is demanded and then it's usually given. Nobody respects anybody today. Therefore, you don't know how they're going to act. We don't respect our parents today. So why would you expect them to, to respect the police officer? Because he's got a gun and a badge? There was a day that that gun and badge meant something. But everybody's got a gun and a badge now. They may not have the badge, but they all got guns. So we have to go back, and again, this is where education comes in. Again, this is where Raising the economics of an area comes in, such that people have meaningful jobs and therefore they'll work those jobs and they'll go home. If we think we're going to get it any other way, it's not going to happen. <clears throat> now, everybody wanted criminal justice reform more, particularly after George Floyd. We wanted to know certain things. We had a bill, I believe it was House Bill 300, may have been Senate Bill 300 where we had to fight just to be able to allow the family members to be able to see the results of what the body cam said. Stuff like that does not make sense, and I've, I've worked in the court system, I've been a lawyer for almost 50 years, and it never made sense to me then, and it doesn't make sense to me now. We are better than that, we just need to push the system to do the right thing. I've worn the uniform of a law enforcement officer in my lifetime. I've worn the uniform of a correctional officer working in the prison system and probation parole. I've seen both ends of the spectrum on this. What happens at the uh, level where individuals is arrested, then they go through the court system, then they become incarcerated. The solution is not more police. I can tell you that right now. That will never be the solution. The solution begins with the basic foundation, as we will all agree, is education. I did my doctoral dissertation on the school to prison pipeline. And during my dissertation, I was writing, trying to develop my theoretical framework, and these, these other things. And the questions kept coming to me, what educational experience led to this individual winding up in prison? Because I'm telling you, it starts in school, okay? My dissertation title is The Pedagogical Relationship Between the School System and the Criminal Justice System in North Carolina. It's a direct relationship. And in that relationship, what I found was that these children, in most cases, had a very negative experience in school. And that negative experience manifested itself into bad behavior. The bad behavior then becomes incarceration. So at the end of the day, if we can get our education system up to par, because the criminal justice system never needed to see me. Raymond Smith Senior took care of all of that, okay? Never had to deal with that. However, the criminal justice system is not where our children need to be. Education is where we need to start. 
Let, let me re-ask the bottom part of the question again. How do you plan to improve the re-imaging of public safety? Well, going, if, you, if you think about it, the district attorney plays a role, okay? How many people in your community don't even know who the district attorney is? How many people don't know how much power that one person has? That one person alone can change the trajectory of criminal justice reform by him or herself because they have unilateral power. Who do they answer to? Nobody, they're an elected official, okay? In Wayne County alone, the district attorney has run for re-election in the last three election cycles completely and absolutely unopposed. So when we start talking about things like criminal justice reform, it begins with the system laws that we already have. We just need to elect people who are willing to utilize their position of authority in that positive way. And instead of allowing people to continue to run unopposed and treat us like they want to. Senator Fitch, you want to read one of them? The laws are enough and already there. It's this thing called discretion. And I, I, I agree with the representative. The system starts with the district attorney. The district attorney has the authority to defer prosecution. The district attorney has the authority to try you as an adult or as a juvenile. The district attorney and programs all ways are in existence. Even for the judge to, to make a decision whether or not to give somebody else another chance or send them off to prison the first time. It is a matter of people having a will and other people having a won't. I watched parents in a courtroom cry over their children when you have to ask them, well, ma'am and sir, how was your child when you were growing up? What type of child was he? And almost 100% would drop their heads. And I may be wrong, but I took that to mean that the same thing that that child is doing now is the same thing that that child did when he was at home. Charity and all stars at home and then it spreads the glory. So, an issue um, was sent in about revitalization. And the question is, what are your plans for helping to fix up I guess, is everybody in here Wilson? No, Goldsboro. Goldsboro in here, all right. Well, this said East Wilson. I'm not from Wilson, so I can't explain where East Wilson is, but. You're in it. I'm in it, all right. East Wilson, East Goldsboro, East Rocky Mount, Edgecombe versus Nash, Little Raleigh versus whatever, it's all the same. I, I imagine the question say is talking about the minority community. If that's what it's all about, there has to be a partnership between not only government, but financial institutions, as well as private developers. If we were to pick Rocky Mount, you've got You've got some of the most beautiful homes I've ever seen over by uh, the Round Yard in Edgecombe County. It, like everything else, needs a little love and a little tender care. Rocky Mount is taking a step to try to do something about it in their partnerships. There's some move afoot in East Wilson where Folks who are from Wilson, who've gone off and made their monies, have come back and have 
have started buying up some of the old properties and trying to fix them up and it makes a difference. If you were to turn out of the parking lot and go down Pender Street, it's not the same Pender Street that it was several years ago. But when you let your housing supply get to the point where it's almost ready to fall down, it takes a little more love and care to bring it back to where it used to be. We just need to stay on the task with everybody being at it and having a a joint mind to be able to improve because where there is a will, there is a way. And a lot of that starts with us and it doesn't necessarily start with government. Question again, um, Representative, is what are your plans for helping to fix up East Wilson? I will use the same methodology that we currently use in Goldsboro. We work very closely with the city council. We work very closely with the county commissioners. Uh, we work very closely with the federal government when it comes to grants. As I talked about before, the CDBG funds, the Community Development Block Grant funds, are a tremendous resource that we used to, um, Tiger grants come from the federal government, all these types of grants come from the government, and we have put millions of dollars into creating a center. Now, the next phase is there's a five-year phase uh, plan through the city of Goldsboro. It's online. You can see it. And it's talking about now spreading out into the other areas of the town. We have North Goldsboro, which, which is referred to as North End. We have uh, East Goldsboro. We have uh, Webb Town. And we have Little Washington. We have the same communities like Senator Fitchstead that they have in Wilson. But the difference is there is a plan in place. And we are going to continue to work with the various entities. Now, there's one piece that's critical in all of this. You have to have county commissioners and city council who have the will to do something about the blighted areas in your community. Where does that come in at? Who you vote for. Because we send millions of dollars to these communities every year. The American Relief Plan funds, we send money through the state budget, there are millions of dollars available to these communities and a plethora of grant opportunities available through the Department of Environmental Quality, um, uh, Department of Commerce. The money's there. We've, we've, got more, we've got more resources now than we've ever had. But you must have a city council, a school board, county commissioners that have the will to focus on those areas. Just a few weeks ago in Goldsboro, students went to the city council complaining about the conditions at Goldsboro High School. Myself and another representative went and toured the school, saw it firsthand. It was atrocious. But it's not because they don't have money. We have a board of education that does not focus on the schools in the inner city. And on any board, seven member board, it only takes four people to get their way. Those four people are right now running for re-election unchallenged. So how dare we complain if we won't get up and challenge them, stop challenge the status quo. Because when they get re-elected, what they're going to do is they're going to make sure that the districts that they live in are taken care of. If I, if I may, this, all of this goes around in cycles and circles. My first involvement in Goldsboro was as a lawyer, as a lawyer, in the North End, the same area that the representative is speaking about, where the sewer didn't run right, where the water wouldn't run. We ended up having to sue Goldsboro in order to have equalization of municipal services. The same things are going to have to happen all over again. Now, CDBG, uh, all of that came because money's running through banks, banks making money and not spending money in the communities that they made the money in. And there has to be, there has to be, I agree with Raymond, a, a seven-man board takes four. And we keep electing people 
who are part of that four who vote the other way. And the only other way, if that's going to be the way that we do it, the only other way that we can do it is do it ourselves. There are funds there, we ought to utilize the funds and put together the partnerships. Sam to Fitch, this one is personalized for you. Individual wrote in, Sam to Fitch, we are concerned with your health, that it is progressively affecting your mobility. Do you feel you have the health that will affect any ability to provide needed services for the community? If I thought my health were in that shape, you wouldn't see me offer myself as a candidate. One of the best presidents that I know in the history of this country, name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. A lot of the progress that we've had in this country now started with him through his New Deal. What is wrong with me is my knees, too much pounding, playing football, and I refuse to have somebody put me to sleep. I refuse to let somebody put me to sleep because if, in fact, throughout my career, I've done something to that doctor or somebody else and he put me to sleep, I'm at his mercy. <laughs> now what fool would do that? Amen. So the answer is there is nothing wrong with my health. Something is wrong with my knees. There's nothing wrong with my mind. There's nothing wrong with my heart. And there's nothing wrong with my energy to fight as I have fought. We can say that about anybody. That's right. I listened to you talk about 35 years, Bishop, preaching. What's wrong with your health? <laughs> One final question, and then we will entertain for just a few moments any things from um, the congregation or po folks present. The final question that was given to me is around prison reform. We, the community, believe that we need extensive help for prisoners to re-enter the workforce. What plans do you propose to assist with this? I would say to you that the sky is the limit because there are funds there if, if the public pushes. Just as the public pushed about re-entry otherwise, about second chance, about expungement of records, as the public does with any way that they see fit to make law. It's not going to happen by itself. The stigma on old prisoners is not the same today because a lot of the folks who have been prisoners understand what the system is about and how to keep out of it. If I owned a big store or a big warehouse and people were stealing from me, who would I hire as a security company? I can't, I'd hire a good thief, one who has reformed himself and knows what to look out for. Who best to save souls? Preachers, because that's what they're trained to do. So I would work closely with the community where I can find the advocates who have that as a desire to listen to their ideas, to try to go where they think that it ought to go because that's where you will learn how to do it, why to do it, and how to do it again. The question being about prison reform, having worked inside the prison myself for a number of years, working with inmates on a day in and day out basis, I can tell you that some of the brightest minds in this world 
are incarcerated. Some of the most brilliant, brilliant young men are incarcerated. They made one mistake. Or, in many instances, wasn't even them. We have to do a much better job in our judicial system when we talk about incarcerating people, first off. But prison reform in and of itself is going to take some laws. We're gonna to have to make we're gonna to have to make it such that individuals who are incarcerated are treated fairly. There was a bill sponsored by one of my um, uh, fellow members of the House, um, Representative Candy Smith, that talked about how women were treated inside the prison. And that bill was, it touched me because I had no idea, because I never worked in a women's prison. I had no idea of the things that were denied women that they need. They were denied. But it took a law to change it. So we, as legislators, are going to have to be ever vigilant in making sure that prison reform takes place. It's not going to take place on its own. We're going to have to make it happen. Okay? Another question was, your platforms seem so similar. What is the distinction of why we should vote for you? Well, I told you before, I even said a bunch of anything that you're not going to see a difference in what we believe in because I think that we were brought up the same way. I think we have the same values and I think we have seen pretty much the same things occurring within our communities. Age sometimes does in fact have its, its privileges. I have the experiences, well-rounded experiences, to be your senator, to continue to fight for those same things that we've been in here talking about today. And it's not that my colleague is not a good man, he is. He is my friend. I just think that based off of what I have done, how I have done it, and when I listen to him talk about what he has done, it sounds just like what I have done. I think I am the better person, and he's going to say he thinks that he's the better person. And I guess the only way that we'll know is if we count the ballot, who is the better person. But I believe that I have the time, the energy, the patience, the knowledge and all to be the person to represent you in this senator district. Thank you for those kind words, Senator. You're welcome. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> He's exactly right. We don't, uh, we don't differ much in policy or um, our understanding of what needs to be done. But we, we're different people, and we bring different skills to the table. Um, one of the things that I can tell you that has made the difference for me since I've been in the legislature, and you've heard me say it throughout tonight, I've done more than one thing in my life. I'm a combat veteran. I'm going to always fight for military and veterans. I'm a school teacher. I'm going to always support school teachers and educators, bus drivers, cafeteria workers. I'm going to always support those people because I was one of them. I've been a law enforcement officer. Been, on, been in the uniform of a law enforcement officer and the uniform of a correctional officer. I was a planner for the Department of Transportation for years. Left that job to come to Goldsboro to start what is now Goldsboro Lane Transportation Authority. I was the first executive director. Goldsboro has an urban bus system that I was instrumental in getting started as its first executive director. So when I 
when I got to the General Assembly and I was placed on these various committees, I was placed in these areas because I had the expertise in each one of these areas. <clears throat> and then, to top it off, education being my number one thing, I have a doctorate in education leadership. That in and of itself qualifies me to have a conversation with anybody about education. And I feel very, very confident in that ability to do so. The worst thing I've seen since I've been in Raleigh is a whole bunch of folks sitting around the table telling us what's best for education. And they have no background in it whatsoever. None. So what differentiates us is our experiences, what we bring to the table. This race was not something that I wanted. We were thrown into this situation. Toby didn't want this and I did not want this, okay? But because there are people who have the power of the pen, we were put into this situation and it is an unfortunate situation. It is a very unfortunate situation. Okay, but at the end of the day, the people of Senate District 4 have a choice. And they have two really good choices. They have two really good choices. The bottom line is, Wilson has been moving forward for the last several years. You elected a new mayor. Gene Farmer Butterfield stepped aside to make way for Linda Cooper Suggs. G.K. Butterfield has stepped aside to make way for a new person to represent. Now the time to keep moving forward. So those are all the questions that were sent. If there are any questions we want to field from the floor, we have about four minutes. Any questions? I got one. Okay, let, let, me, let me tell, let me just remind us what the questions are. Question means ask the question, you know. Not dissertation, we wanna ask the question. Just have to get that out before we begin. Yes, ma'am. This is for Raymond Smith. You saying that y'all been up north end, redoing stuff, building stuff? No, that's next in the phase. Nick, that's that in, the, that's in first, the city's plan. That should have been the first in the phase. That's one of the oldest blocks on in Wayne County. That should have been one of the first ones. We got more regular houses up there and people living in regular houses than anything in, in, in around. North End always been the, the last one to get anything. But they knew people living in North End now that, you know, as me, as for instance. I came from Whiptown. Me too. I, you know, I ain't seen nothing they doing up there for, for us. Nothing. Not even infrastructure. Very good question. No more than Weaver Street. Very, very good question, Ms. Nagin. As I said before, we sent the money. Your city council is responsible for revitalizing that part of town. It's part of the city of Goldsboro. That's not what legislators do. Our job is to send the money. Now what we've got to do in Goldsboro is we've got to elect a city council that has the will to put North End first. I agree with you 100%. I don't disagree with anything you said, but we've got to understand how the system works. We can't tell the city of Goldsboro how they're going to spend that money that we send unless we put it in the form of an earmark, okay? Same thing with the county commissioners. That's why we talked about a few minutes ago, four individuals on the county commissions determine what gets prioritized. Four individuals on the Board of Education determine what gets prioritized. Four individuals on the Goldsboro City Council determine that North End was not a priority for them. So we got to take this same argument to the City Council, and I'll go with you. Standpoint, but in terms of their social and emotional learning, what 
type of resources are being provided to teachers who want to teach students but also have moments that they have to defend themselves because of the children who have had this social and emotional breakdown? We have um, a tremendous amount of money through the American Relief Plan. All of that money is, you can take that money and you can use it any way you want to in the school system to help with remediation, to help with social emotional um, uh, damage that has been caused by COVID. All of that is waiting for people like yourself to come up with a plan or a program. And it will definitely, if it's, it's, a, if it's approved, you'll get the funding. And we want community uh, agencies, churches, nonprofits, we want them to come up with plans and programs to tap into these funds. The funds are there. More money than we've ever had before. The money is there, and you are exactly right. That's one of the biggest challenges we're going to have to get those kids caught up educationally, but then we've got to deal with the social emotional piece. And I, and I know that we're going to have to fund psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors. We're going to have to fund all of that. And all of that can be done with the money that we, that we came, that most of that came from the federal government. Yeah. First thing we can do is stop treating educators as babysitters. Secondly, in a school system, the law calls for a racial divide. In other words, you should have so many nurses within a school, you should have so many uh, psychiatrists and psychologists, social workers. Not only is Leandro woefully missing, the whole educational system mm -hmm. is woefully missing what the experts say you need to have in order to make a well-rounded child. Now, <clears throat> if in fact you miss something over here, there's only one way that I'm aware that you can get it back. There's only one person that I know that can unring a bell that is wrong. So you are going to have to go back in and remediate. It means that somebody is going to have some after school programs. It means that some places that don't have year round may have to have some form of year round education. Summers are not going to be as long for play. You're going to have to buckle down in order to make it work. Those are the things that I call common sense approaches and answers. I, I, I come along at a point in time that I was in a segregated school. But I would take my segregated teachers and stack them up against what I thought was better on the other side of the track. Even though I had a used book, as long as I had a page on it, that teacher would that love talking and we're going to have to go back to understand that it takes a whole village to rear a child. Bishop. That was the final question I have. Yes, sir. Um, for anybody that don't know me, I'm from Edgecombe County, and I can't vote for neither one of these guys. But I am... <laughs> All right. But what I want to say is, I love this type of environment. I know I'm going to get to the question. With two black brothers sitting here and not fighting amongst themselves, that's what we need. But my question is, and I would like to see this done, and, and I'm, I'm going around, like I said, I cannot vote for either one of them, but what I do know, y'all have educated people like this question this lady asked. People need to know those things. They, 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 I tell people you got to know what the process is. But my point is, I would like to see you guys. I, my question is, you, you in Goldsboro and he in Wilson, will you guys still work together no matter who wins? And one could be a liaison in, in, in Goldsboro, one could be in Wilson County. Will you be willing to work together? Because so many times I see people in the process, but when one go home, they go home. But I think it's time for us to start working together. And that will bring some more stability back to the black community, see us working together.
as I said from the very beginning, I don't know any better. I was working in my community before I was ever elected to a public office. I will continue working in my community and I will continue working for Democrats, no matter what happens. Does the picture have laugh? No laugh? <laughs> my record speaks for itself. I've always worked with somebody else. I never even wanted to be an elected official. I never wanted to be an elected official purely because I'm blunt. People don't like people who are blunt. I call it like I see it. Oh, yeah. A strike is a strike and a ball <laughs> is a ball. So I don't fit in as a round peg and a round hole. I see nothing different about my tomorrow that I see about my today. When the good Lord is ready for me to go, I'm going. <laughs> Not until. I hear you. <laughs> All right. Is that it? Can we thank these two gentlemen for coming to be with us? Remember tonight was about informing people, educating us about platforms. Um, the gentleman just stated it correctly that with the, the issues that we have sometimes is our fighting, but thank, thank God for these two men, honorable men who come and lay the platforms on the table. We hear what they have to say. Now folks are informed so they can leave and make an informed decision when they go in to vote. The, the number one thing I'll leave with us all is make sure we go in the booth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go in the booth. <laughs> our so early we, voting. Uh, our early voting. Yeah, early voting, voting, voting starts Thursday, right? <laughs> Thursday, so make sure you go in the vote. I'm going to pray for us and then we'll, we'll leave you. Let's all stand together. And Bishop, if you haven't registered the vote, you can do it one Same stop. Day. Same day. Yes, yes, sir. Same day voting, one stop voting is available on Thursday. Make sure not only you vote, but everybody in your house vote. <laughs> your children vote, my grandma would say. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this occasion. Thank you for informed minds. Thank you for what you have done to bring us all together. Ask that. Something has been said or done that we will leave here the better as a result. And thank you for this pastor and, and her willingness to work with the community. So we ask for blessings upon her life. And we praise God for her. Bless these two candidates, whatever the road she'll trot. We give you praise and glory and honor that you are going to keep us and give us what we need. It is in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.